Hi everybody, it's Jim from Sprague Wood Turning. This week we're going to use some more awesome maple burl and we're going to be using the deep cast with two different colors looking for that color separation like we did with the Peacock Holoform 3.0. Well, what we have here is a really large, burly, ugly looking maple burl. <laughs> uh, there's really not a whole lot that can be done with this. It's, you know, it would be really awesome to cast something like this in resin, but you're talking probably, if I had to guess, six gallons of resin. So, you know, when it comes to big burls like this, this is dry. This has been kicking around for years and it came to me recently. Uh, I just tested it. It's dry, so that's not a problem. So, you know, what I think I'm going to do is actually cut this into pieces. And so, I've got here, let me get my form here. So, this is a template for the bottom of my five gallon bucket. And, you know, if you start spacing this out, you know, you can get one here, get one here. So you'd be able to get three castings out of this. And this is really deep here. So you could maybe even cut this and get four castings out of this one burrow. While it would be absolutely cool to try and cast something this large and turn it, which you certainly could do, uh, you know, this thing would be well into the thousands to um, basically cover the cost of it. And you know, that's a very exclusive market. And the other issue with that is, this would be so large that I wouldn't be able to uh, core this. That's the other big one. Ah, uh, maybe, how big is this? Yeah, maybe you could. You'd have to trim it a little bit. You know, probably about 18 inches is what I'd be comfortable coring on my on my current leaf. So you know the, these are all problems that you're going to encounter as a wood turner. Uh, so anyway what we're going to do is probably cut off a section here like I said with this bucket. There is an issue on the back side. Somebody went at this with the chainsaw so we're going to have to try and avoid that. That's no good. But um, this is going to be for this is going to be uh, for a charity auction here in Canada for the Canadian Occupational Therapy Foundation. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to turn a large outside bowl. We'll core the center out of this, and we'll use it for something at a later date. But uh, that's the plan. So what we're going to do along with this is their logo is logo is green. So we're going to use some emerald green. And what I want to do is do this in two pours. So what I'm going to do is mix up the green, pour that, cast it today. And then I'm going to also mix up some pure gold. And then inject that into the green tomorrow. That's the plan as it stands right now. So we haven't done that before, and I'm really curious to see if it's going to work. I was tempted to use Artcast to do the injection the next day, uh, just for good separation. But after talking to the owner of Designer Epoxy, he wasn't so sure if that was going to work. And I'm kind of on a, on a timeline, deadline here, so I need to get this done, and I need a for sure thing. So that's this video. All right, first thing we're going to do is go to the bandsaw and cut this piece off, and then we'll have something to work with. Yeah, I'm just going to temporarily hold that in place. There's no place for this to screw into down here, so that's why I'm doing it like that. All right, let's go to the bandsaw. So it would be really cool to keep this burl together and, and do it in one casting. Uh, but like I said, you know, it, it, it's a very exclusive market because what I would do with this 
is I would turn it into a bowl set. And, you know, I think that a bowl set that large that's got probably five bowls in it would probably sell for $3,000. And that's a very exclusive market. So sometimes it's best to cut these pieces up. Uh, that way you can sell them at a lower price point and get your money back quicker. So before we can do any casting, of course, we got to get rid of all of the bark. And there I'm using a wire brush mounted in my drill. And this is so important, I can't stress this enough, especially with the burl, uh, to kind of score up the surface so that there won't be any adhesion issues with the resin. And of course, making sure that you blow all of the material out of it is also important. That way, there's no floaties when you go to pour the resin. I'm gluing these pieces in place because I don't want to throw a weight on the top of this. There is going to be a resin pocket, and I don't want the weight to encroach into that area while the resin's curing. Okay, I think that's glued in there pretty good. What I'm going to do is wait till the end of the day, then we'll mix up the resin and do the pour then. This week we're going to be using deep casting epoxy again and the reason for that is because I think when I initially pour this it is six and a half inches deep and of course that is over the manufacturer's recommended depth of pour but uh, I like to really kind of push the limits on it to see exactly how far I can go. Um, so anyway I'm going to put some emerald green in this and um, I just emerald green is such a popular color and then we'll be able to add the gold tomorrow. I'm going to assume that this is going to take at least three, but we'll start here and see what happens. Yeah, I'd say it's going to take at least three. I'll mix some more up and I'll bring it back when I'm done. This is another liter and a half, so that'll bring us up to three liters so far. Give it one more and that's it. I don't want to give it any more than that because we don't want any thermal cracking. Because we're getting pretty close to the limit. So this is another liter and a half. So this will bring us up to four and a half liters. So if you're curious, that's about six and a half inches deep. That's how deep this is. All right, we just got to mix up some gold and then we can get this. Well, I can put this in the pressure pot. I'll bring back when I'm mixing up some gold. I also, I know I mentioned this earlier, but I also used deep cast to mix the gold up. That way there wasn't any interactions between the two resins. All right, so it has been 23 hours. I came out here at the 15 hour mark. Uh, if you remember, I put this in my clean room in the pressure pot and I turned the thermostat down to 65 Fahrenheit and you know this this epoxy really needs 70 75 degrees in order to start the curing process so when I checked it after 15 hours it was very liquidy still like almost like I just poured it almost um, as you can see there's some bubbles now I took it out of the pressure pot at the 15 hour mark moved it over by my heater and turned it up to 75 degrees and so you know it, it is definitely starting to get thicker now I'm hoping that this is going to be thick enough that you know we're, we're going to get some good color separation I've been blowing the bubbles off but they're getting harder and harder to blow off so I'm gonna do that and what I'm gonna do is just pour the gold on the top of this and then take this stick and plunge it down and straight up through the resin and the hope is that that's going to give us kind of elongated gold streaks coming up through this piece that's the theory anyway So this resin has, is definitely a lot thicker than it usually is. 
So that's a positive sign. I'm just hoping that it's going to be enough. I have to do this because I've got other things to do here and I just I can't watch it any longer. It's definitely thicker for sure. All right, that's it. I'm not going to mess with it anymore. You can stop yelling. All right, I'll put this in the push pot, and we'll see you in 72 hours. Maybe a little sooner. I don't know. Probably 72 hours, though. Well, I'm liking the look of that. Bring that light over a little bit. Looks like we've got some good color separation. So uh, let's see how much of a struggle it's going to be to get this out of the bucket. Because remember, I glued these pieces in place so they wouldn't move around. So yeah, either way, let's see if it'll come out. That wasn't too bad. Looks like a good solid casting. And uh, so you know, the depth of that is five and a half inches. And of course that is over the, the, um, the manufacturer's recommended depth of pour, but that just goes to show you what you can do with deep cast. All right, we've got a center here. I'm just going to flatten off a little area here so that the uh, the drive center or the live center will sit flush. That's not too bad. Starting off with the Ellsworth gouge here, the 5 8 bowl gouge. And there's probably going to be some people wonder why I didn't cut off those pieces of burl and reuse them. The main reason for that is to do it in a timely fashion, I probably would have done it on the bandsaw. And anytime you're cutting anything round on the balance bandsaw like that, it's, it's actually pretty dangerous. Didn't take long to take the edge off of that, that tool, I'll tell you. And once you get into that resin, so... Now I've switched out to the Hercules. So yeah, I know that there's going to be some people say, oh, you know, you could have saved those pieces. But, you know, the thing is, I could have took my chainsaw and cut those pieces off. But after the kerf of the chain, I mean, really, it wasn't worth the, the effort to do it. So that's why I decided to just turn it into shavings and not save them. So the goal right now is to actually just get this all trimmed off, all this excess resin. And then once we have that trimmed off, we'll be able to determine for sure what's going to be up and what's going to be down. Because at this point, I'm not 100% sure. I'm thinking that the, the side that's on the drive center is probably going to be the bottom and, and it ends up being that. But uh, you never know until you get it all cleaned off. Whew, I knew better than to do that too. It come off the end of that and that just shattered and it completely splattered me like, wow. I guess I'll throw my coat back on and wear a glove until I can get this nice and rounded. Anyway, that hurt. Uh, there, that'll do for now. Trust me, I'm a first dater. So that is exactly what happens when you're too aggressive with resin. This stuff is 
you know, it's it's not 100% cured, but it's getting there. And pulling that, pulling the Hercules off the end too quickly caused that resin to shatter and it just sprayed shrapnel everywhere. Uh, this is why, you know, I, I always encourage all wood turners to wear face shields, a full face shield and not safety glasses because uh, can you imagine that resin coming off and smacking you in the face so you know i always wear a full face shield when turning self-powered respirator when turning because that's certainly another issue in the wood turning trade here and um so anyway you know it just <laughs> i was in a hurry to get this done to get it to its first coat of finish and in the end um i you know i had to take a step back from it and just say okay like slow down here so that uh you don't have other pieces flying around the shop because nobody wants that Still working on the excess resin, getting rid of it. There is a shape emerging from this that I'm actually kind of liking. There, there was a couple of spots where that hot melt glue was that was an issue. So I wanted to get, get rid of that, the majority of it anyway. And, you know, just kind of shape the base of this piece. And then from there, I'll figure out exactly what kind of a shape that I want to go for. Uh, you know, again, I, I don't want to be handcuffed by a plan when I when I step to the lathe, put the pieces of wood on, clean off the excess resin, and then see what it tells you. So as I was cleaning off the bottom, I looked at that little resin bottom that was sitting there and I said, you know, hey, that looks pretty cool. I have to make a decision on whether we're going to keep that or not. But, you know, usually I'm not a fan of resin ghosting the wood beneath, if you follow. But when it would come to um, a foot like this, I think that that's a total different situation. Um, anyway, please share your thoughts on that. I, I just, I don't know, for some reason on the sides, it really bothers me when I haven't exposed all of the wood and uh, just have the resin between the pieces. The plan is to put a waste block on the bottom of this. So all I'm doing on the top here is cutting a tenon so that I can reverse it and hold it with a chuck when we decide to uh, put the waste block on it. And um, I find this method to be probably the most accurate where it's being, as long as you can get it running true in the, the chuck, then when you put the glue block on the bottom, it usually lines up pretty good. And instead of chiseling it off, I just decided to grind that. If you try to chisel off burl grain, sometimes it tends to really chip out. So that's why I didn't want to do it that way. Now that I've got it reversed, I just want to clean up that little foot area. And then you'll see me use some 60 grit just to prep the resin so that the glue block will stick to it nicely. There it is. And that is hot melt glue that's been dipped in an electric frying pan. I'll let that sit up for about 15 minutes, then clean it off with the gouge. I don't like using the Hercules here or any other carbide cutters because the hot melt glue tends to clog up the cutter. So just using the gouge here and then we'll be switching back to the Hercules here pretty soon. We are all ready for coring. This is the one-way coring system. This is the number one knife. And I uh, can't use any tailstock support yet until the cutter goes all the way in for a ways. Once that happens, I'll be able to put this in the tailstock and then we'll be able to get some support. So hopefully nothing bad happens until that can get in there. <laughs> 
I should also mention that I'm using the Core Pro cutter from Hunter Tool Systems, and that is a replacement cutter that goes onto the knife set from One Way. Uh, One Way makes fantastic products, but uh, this little cutter that Hunter Tools makes is an absolutely awesome addition to your coring rig. If you don't have one, I really do recommend getting one. I don't know how many cuts are on this, 50, 60, and I haven't even flipped the cutter yet. And when I say cuts on it, I mean resin and burl cuts. Some of the toughest stuff that you're going to core out ever. So pretty soon we'll be able to get some tailstock support in here. And once that happens, you know, you, as a as a wood turner that's done any coring, you're going to appreciate it. Once you get that tailstock support in there, you're like, oh, okay, I can take a breath of air now because, you know, I'm not so worried about this going flying. The only drawback about having tailstock support is now you can't extract the tool properly to clean the shavings. So that's the only real negative uh, on this, but I will, because you're working with dried wood, uh, you can just use the, the compressed air to blow it out and uh, everything went fine after this, had no issues with it at all. And there you go, another gorgeous, beautiful piece of wood and resin saved. We are now mounted outboard, just using the Phoenix to get in tight to the chuck. Still undecided at this point what the fate's going to be on the foot or not. Uh, so it's a little out of round. So just truing this up, taking light cuts. It's important that when you put your glue, uh, your waste block on the bottom pieces like this, that you really push it up tight. If there's a lot of glue between the waste block and the piece that you're gluing it to, there may be some flex out near the rim area. So that's why I like to put them on as tight as I can to avoid those issues. But I do see a shape developing. Okay, we got a small, you know, there's a couple of small holes here, nothing too, too major. Uh, right where there was a little bit of that hot melt glue left there, we'll fill that in. Spot right there. And uh, where these worm passages were. And all I'm going to use is the clear UV resin from Designer Epoxy. Oh, that's more than enough. And if you've never seen this stuff before, it's cured with a UV light. There you go. I'll put this on here for about four minutes. I'll do the other one and then we will do the inside. Some people might wonder if I stand there and hold that for four minutes, and the answer is no. <laughs> Once the top of the UV epoxy kind of hardens up, I usually set the UV light down on top of it and let it sit there for, for four minutes or, or so. Uh, the deeper the tint in the UV resin, I do recommend longer times with the UV light. That is certainly... that. The, the tint of the epoxy will certainly be a factor so be aware of that but you know this I don't know if you've noticed but I've used a ton of this in the last few videos it has really become you know it, it's it's as it's as important as the CA glue is to me if you've got really large gaps to fill in you know designer epoxy does make a quick cure but you know that's two to three hours is how that's going to take but when you're using the UV resin, I mean, four minutes and there you are, you're back in business. So, you know, really, really great addition. And I do highly recommend checking it out if you've never used it before.
just like it is when we core each and every time, usually down in the belly of the bowl, unless the outside profile of your bowl matches the knife set exactly, you're going to have to clean out that area. So that's what I'm doing there. Those calipers, I got them from Lee Valley and they are the largest set that they sell. And that's been a really good addition to my workshop as well. Lee Valley will always, well, for the most part, put out really good products. Uh, you pay for it. They're not cheap, but Lee Valley is, uh, is probably my number one go-to store when it comes to uh, hand tools, for sure. Well, we're certainly getting there. Got to go a little bit thinner on the very bottom, but I think that we're pretty close. There is a few spots that need to get filled in. There's a hole right here up on the rim, hole down in here. See it there probably. Uh, so anyway, I'm just going to do the UV resin again. I might just slightly tint it and uh, I'm going to call it a day for today. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm going to put this in my clean room and I'm sure it's going to move a little bit overnight. So we'll have to trim that up and then um, we'll be able to get our first coat of finish on. See you tomorrow. All right, so it is the next day. So, so before I trim this up, I want to cover this again. Uh, the most common question that I get is what type of hot melt glue I use. And this is what I use right here. This is Mastercraft hot melt glue. It comes from Canadian Tire here in Canada. Uh, there's 50 in a pack. I believe it's around 25 bucks, something like that. And uh, I don't know if there's any Canadian tires in the US or not. If there is, let me know. I'm kind of curious. But anyway, uh, I don't think that it matters one bit what type of hot melt glue you use, as long as it's just hot melt glue. Uh, but anyway, most common question that I get, so just use any glue that you've got or you can get your hands on. As long as it's hot melt glue, it should work. So we're just going to do a final little trimming on this and then we'll be able to move on to sanding. Uh, I thought that I would leave this kind of panned out view in and that shows you kind of the position of the tool handle. Uh, right now, and I mean this is because I'm left handed, it's tucked into my left side. So you know, I'm, I'm swinging my body with the tool. I'm not using my arms. Well, I'm using my arms, but <laughs> I'm not, it's not a lot of arm movement. It's a lot of body movement. And I do this typically when I'm really trying to get a fine surface. When I'm, you know, this is basically what I'm doing just before I'm getting ready to sand. And that way the tool is nice and steady. And the steadier you are, then of course that will translate to the surface of your bowl as well. So hopefully that helps everybody. Uh, the, the tool is basically held at a 45 degree angle from the floor upwards and at a 45 degree angle in front of my body. And I find with the Hercules and with the Osprey, or sorry, not the Osprey, the Phoenix, well, the Osprey too, they tend to cut best at those angles. And here you can see I'm doing pull cuts and push cuts and I'm well above center. Again, with that tool being tilted to the right, when you do that, you're very unlikely to get a catch. Just a couple areas to fill in with the CA glue so that we can carry on with the project and get this piece sanded up. Uh, you know, as, as I'm working on this piece, you know, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, this is going to be a really, really nice piece after this resin is polished. And I'll stress again that, you know, when you're working with resin, you cannot be aggressive with it like you can with wood. You have to really just kiss the surface with the cutter and let the cutter do the work. And if you do that, then you should have a really clean surface that's ready for sanding. Speaking of sanding, these are the three and a half inch dimple discs from sandpaper.ca. And there is a link in the description to get 10% off your next order. And yes, they do ship to the U.S. This piece was sanded from 60 to 800. I typically find that I take three or four passes with each grit. And that's usually all I need to do to move on to the next grit. And then, of course, the next grit, I'll reverse the lathe and the drill direction. And I find that it just gives me a cleaner cut. So if you have a reversible lathe, 
Please try this method. You'll find you'll probably get a better finish. Prep surface anyway. Like I do each week, this is the Triple E buffing compound from the Be All buffing system. Once that's done, I'll then clean the surface with denatured alcohol to remove any residue. And we'll get ready for our first coat of finish on this beautiful bowl. It should just absolutely glow. Right, what I have here is Waterlux Medium Sheen. Apparently Waterlux is changing their labels, so there's no point in showing you the can. I did get a message from Mike, and I, during the voiceover, I'll place that here as to the codes if you're looking for the Medium Sheen or the Gloss. Yeah, I got an email from Mike this past week, and so the Medium Sheen is 5284. Thanks again, Mike, for sending that along. And for the original gloss is 3182. I know that it's been a bit confusing because they're changing their labels. Oh, my camera died just before I was going to take this off. What do you think of that? Islands in a green sea. Very, very nice. That's really cool. And the inside, well, it ain't too shabby either. It's kind of heavy with this chuck on it. All right, we'll see you tomorrow for the second coat. Awesome. This is mainly directed to the new people. Uh, I always use Triple E buffing compound between coats of finish with the Waterlux. And same thing as the first coat. Once that's done, the finish is leveled and all the little lumps and bumps are taken out of it. Use denatured alcohol, get it ready for the next coat. Good morning. This is the second coat of Waterlux Medium Sheen. All right, the coolness continues. Love that island. But it's not really an island, because on the other side, it's actually attached. Pretty cool, right? This is pretty much an island here. Just an island on a foreign planet of some sort. Very cool. Right, I'm going to try and two coat this today because I believe it's going to take three coats. And then we'll see you when we're doing the bottom. She's a beauty. All right, so it is the next day and it actually only took two coats. But I did notice that there's something in the finish here, but that's okay. When I put the coats on the bottom, I'll do another coat over the top. But I am going to get rid of this resin collar that's on the resin foot that's on the bottom try and show you why there's lots of bubbles on the inside of it and uh, that's no good so we need to get rid of that also uh, because this was mounted in the chuck never even seen this but there's actually a piece there that's got a lot of bubbles in it too uh, I don't think it takes away from the piece it actually adds a little bit of interest to it anyway we'll put this on the vacuum chuck and get this cleaned off I really was looking to, to hold on to this, but it's just, it's not going to look good if we do, so it's got to come off. I also find where the, uh, that section with the bubbles in it, it almost looks like an eyeball. <laughs> so that was another reason to leave it. I, I don't know, I just thought it was kind of a cool feature, but I didn't really care for the randomness with the bubbles all through that foot. So that was the main reason why I took it off. But yeah, I was really looking, I really was hoping to keep it, but in the end it just didn't work out. So I just removed the maple waste block with the gouge. Now we're just going to clean this up with the Hercules. And the bottom of this was sanded from 120 to 500. Like I said in my previous video, I'm not going to go any higher than 500 on the bottom of these pieces. That way it's easier to get my signature and details on the very bottom when there's resin present. 
So if you watched the entire video, thank you so much for that. I really do appreciate it. And hey, if you haven't subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. Let's finish this video up. Let's have a last little look at this beautiful little bowl. It's not little, it's nine inches by five and three quarters tall, actually. Uh, perfect color separation. It is exactly what I was going for. Loving these little islands that you see in the piece. I will put rotating footage up at the end like I usually do, but you know, this, this bowl is just absolutely packed full of character and it's really nice. So hopefully uh, whoever's in the auction, too bad it's a closed auction. I didn't mention that in the video, but it is a closed auction. So uh, it's only for the members. They're only allowed to, uh, to bid on it, but it is a beautiful bowl, slight curve to it. Here is the, um, the very bottom. Didn't get a chance to get any finish on it. As per normal, I'm kind of running out of time, so that's why. And uh, I did come out here last night with the intention of putting another coat of finish on it. But when I looked at it, it looked really good. Uh, and the, it wasn't, it didn't feel like it was ready to be buffed. So I, I said, okay, I'm going to leave it. And then I noticed there was a spot here this morning that it needs to be repaired. Right here, I'll, I'll show you. I don't even know if you're going to be able to see it or not. So anyway, when I put the coats of finish on the very bottom, my last coat will go over the very hull outside of it and all of that will be all perfect and ready to go to its new home, whoever that will be. I'm gonna set this down. Don't forget to put designer epoxy in the comments down below, all by itself, two separate words. Um, and that is only for Canada and the lower 48 US states. So the rest of the world we can't accommodate you at this time. And uh, by putting a comment down below, you'll also be entered into my bowl draw at 95,000 subscribers. I think we're sitting at 20 or 92.5, somewhere around there. So uh, we're getting there. And so uh, I need to explain this again as far as these epoxy draws. So it's every 10,000 subscribers. So we did a giveaway at 90,000. So the video at 90,000 forward till we hit 100,000. Those are the only videos that are, gonna, that are gonna count for the epoxy giveaway. I see people putting designer epoxy on videos that were done two years ago. Those are not gonna count, so there's really no need for you to do that. And along with that too, it's the same thing with my giveaways every 5,000. So the giveaway video at 90,000 forward until we hit 95, the 95,000 subscriber giveaway uh, bowl or whatever it's gonna be video. Those are the only ones that are going to count. So I, I see people putting comments in at, you know, 80,000. Oh, please put me into your bowl draw. But those comments won't count. Only the ones from 90 to 95. Uh, so hopefully that's clear. All right, well, that's it. Thanks for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. And if you can share my videos with your friends on your social media platforms, that is the biggest way for me to, to grow my channel here on YouTube. I would really appreciate it. And of course, that thumbs up will always help as well. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do next week. I've got a couple irons in the fire right now, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do first. So anyway, I think both of them are going to be really cool projects. So um, come on back for that next week. All right, well, that's it. Take care. Stay safe. Don't forget that bell. And we'll see you next Friday.